So this is part three of my six month video of living in a school bus uh, out in the desert. And I did the video as much for, for my own amusement and reference later so that I can look back and see milestones of, okay, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. You know, like the solar panels are now out here. I've got the new generator, I've got the welder. Um, I'll, I'll see the truck camper in the video and like, oh, that's when I had that. You know, I've, I've been living in the truck for a while now. You know, I, I, it's like, how long has it been? I have to go back and look at earlier videos to see when I built it. I think I've been in it for over a couple of months anyway. You know, it's, it seems like I've been doing that for a long time. So anyway, but you know, I look at some of the projects that never got done or got started or got pushed back and so I'm going to try to hit on them real quick. I mentioned the domes. I showed you the circles in the dirt out there. And before that, I had actually sketched up and actually put lines in the in you know lines in the sand, as they say. I sketched up and drew an outline of a basic house design that I thought, okay, I could build it fairly quickly to get out of the school bus. Um, not so much that I hated the bus, but there was some issues that I had that it would have been easier if I had the bus and something else. And I think that's the, probably the best way to look at it as if I slept in uh, even a shack, that would free up room in the bus. Because right now everything is in the bus. In the back I've got tools and storage and my tinker space and just random piles of crap and then the kitchen and the pantry in my office and the bedroom, all in about a 30 foot long metal box, right? Yep, definitely a helicopter outside. I just paused. To, I'm gonna take a quick look, I'll be right back. Yeah, that was weird. A helicopter flew dead over us, over me, and it wasn't Border Patrol. Well, actually, usually the helicopter I see out here is Customs. It's got a blue stripe. Border Patrol would be a green stripe. Border Patrol doesn't seem to have their own helicopter out here, but I've seen the Customs one several times. That one had a black bottom, so it wasn't them. Anyway, moving on. But yeah, he flew dead over me, straight line, didn't deviate, just cruised right on down the valley, so don't know. Okay, so I felt like I wanted to get out of the bus for a few reasons. The biggest things is the school bus, it's all windows, it's not well insulated, it's hard to keep cool in the summer, it's hard to keep warm in the winter. Um, it's not made very well for living in and I didn't want to put a lot of time into things like you know if for instance if you built a roof oops, if you built a roof over the bus to get shade 
that would cool it off a lot. Okay, well, I didn't want to build a roof over a 30 foot long school bus just to shade the bus. If I'm going to build a 30 foot roof, I'm going to use it for my workshop, right? Things like that. If I spent the time, you know, covering the walls in, you know, wood, I could put insulation in there. You can make it a lot more comfortable, but then you lose a couple inches of ceiling height, which is almost critical now. It's about a six foot two ceiling. I'm 5'11 and I wear boots, so that puts me closer to six feet. If I did a two inch ceiling, I'm gonna be hitting my head, you know, so it's right on the edge. The floor, I noticed last night because it was in the 30s last night. I think that's the first night I've been out here that it was the 30s this fall or spring when I came out here, it was probably near freezing because I saw frost a couple times. Um, so the floor is pretty cold too. Floor doesn't seem to be insulated at all from what I can see. It's just a metal floor with a thin rubber coating over it. And from what I can see looking through the holes in the floor, there's no insulation underneath it at all. And there's holes in the floor because when I took the seats out, that's where the bolts went through and I just never did anything with them. It hasn't been a problem yet until now it's starting to get cold so there was you know it's like you can't um it's hard to do you know it's hard to maintain what you got and move forward at the same time so you kind of have to decide do i want to put a year's worth of energy into the bus or do i want to put that energy into something else so i had started drawing house plans sketched up some ideas and this was just simple you know not very big, um, ranging from 12 feet wide, uh, 24 feet long to um, one was about 16 feet wide, 20 feet long, 24 feet long. You know, it was, I was looking at even increments of four feet, you know, four, four by eight sheets of uh, OSB and plywood. So nothing complicated, just a basic square. And uh, the first one, I, I was like, okay, I can build that fairly quickly. I was thinking, okay, put some posts in the ground, set them in concrete, build your floor from that, stand your walls up, make some trusses, boom, you're done. It could be done in a week or two. And I thought, okay, once I was ready, I'd buy all the materials, have them sitting there, set the concrete posts, then get two weeks of leave, knock it out, and I'd be done. Right? And realistically, a simple thing like that, I mean, I helped my brother build... Uh, a porch for his trailer a couple three days you know it, we did a couple weekends or one weekend and then a couple of evenings after work or something like that and we knocked it out it was pretty quick so you know I'd be by myself and since I don't do that kind of thing very much it would be slower and there'd be a lot of wasted time trying to figure out how to do something I should know how to do but I figured reason, reasonably I could build a house in a couple of weeks and then finish it as I, as I go, but you know, just to sh get the shell on the outside. And then, you know, once once I can close the door, then I can insulate it after, kind of like that. So I was all looking at that. I'm like, okay, that kind of makes sense. I can do that. It should be pretty quick. And then I started getting the big rainstorms, and that's when I realized where I had drawn where I wanted the house was in a low spot. <laughs> it would have flooded something horrible. Um, I was planning on putting it up a little bit, so but I still would have had a foot of water running under the house or six inches or whatever. So I'm like, ooh, yikes, that was close. You know, I'm glad I didn't have money that week because I would have gone out and started buying materials and then all of a sudden realized I'm in the middle of a flood, flood zone. Honestly, flooding was never something I thought about. I knew it rained out here a little bit. But, you know, I, I think I figured it would average about two inches per month all year long is what the average. Well, I didn't understand what they meant when they said monsoon season. Uh, it's nearly like tropical. There's, there's times where you get a good solid rain in the middle of the afternoon, or between 12 and 1 or something like that. And then it clears off and you get sunshine again. Very similar to what I had when I lived on Guam. Um, it, it never occurred to me that I could get an inch of rain in an hour 
you know, that just blew my mind, you know, thinking an inch in a week, you know, not all at, all at once. And that's the thing is when the rain comes, you know, Texas, they, they do everything big here, including storms and flooding. Um, you get all the rain all at once, boom, the ground saturates, the water just stands and runs across the ground. And then a few hours later, it's almost dusty again. It's gone. And you're like, where did it go? Anyway, so I had to back up on that, looked around, found a better spot um, where I circle, made the circle marks. That's a lot higher than the low spot. You know, a couple feet, but it makes a difference here. Uh, because there is a low area, the water tends to go that direction away from the higher spot. Then, you know, I had looked at domes a few times over the years. And when I was camping out here, I thought I should build a dome and leave it out here just so that I have a place to come when I come out for camping. And, you know, not worry about, you know, somebody stealing what's inside because I wouldn't leave anything of value there and it'd just be a simple dome. There's uh, instructions and whatnot on the internet where you use half inch conduit, but I guess you could use different sizes, but half inch is common. And you cut them all to the certain length, smash the ends flat, drill a hole in the ends, and then you can bolt them together pretty easily. And you know, if you follow the basic dimensions of um, Bucky, Buck, Buck, Buckmeister Fuller's, Mr. Fuller's geodesic dome formulas, so you, you have these different sizes, different formulas, cut them all, and the one I'm doing is two different lengths. And you set the demo, the, you figure out the dimensions, and you cut them all, and you mark them, and then you just bolt it together, and it makes this nice dome. And I don't know. To me, I, that just appealed to me. You know, if I could do something round instead of a square house, I mean, there's there's challenges, but it just seemed fun. I thought, okay, I can do that. And you make it out of fairly inexpensive materials. It is also important. So. I'm like, okay, so I could. I, I was thinking I could build something like that. So when I realized that the original house design was in a bad area, I just threw everything up and I'm like, oh, I could build a dome instead. So I kind of went forward from there with the domes. And I spent a lot of time in the first three months I was out here marking the area, started digging holes, started real. That's when I realized that there was huge rocks all over out here. Then I got excited I could build something out of rocks. I hadn't really decided what to build rocks. I thought if I built the foundations for the domes out of masonry, you know, big rocks and concrete, that would look cool because, you know, they're rocks from my property. That was kind of fun. Um, they're free because they're on my property. I just have to go buy the concrete. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go do that. So I spent a couple of months um, weekends and a couple hours in the in the day before I went to work because I my work starts at four in the afternoon until midnight, so I would leave here by two. Uh, in the school bus, you can't sleep in; you got too many windows, and I, I don't like covering all my windows. I like to be able to see out, so I didn't want to have to open all the drapes, close all the drapes every day. So I just leave it open. I can't see any neighbors from here. You know, they're out there and they're out there, but they're far enough away I don't see them. So I thought, okay, I wake up too early in the morning anyway. You know, a lot of times I see the sunrise, you know, I'm, I'm, I may pull my head under the covers, but then I know I'm awake, so I get up eventually. So I'd have three or four hours, so I think, okay, what can I do? So I got a wheelbarrow and a shovel, and then eventually a big uh, rock pick and a wrecking bar, and uh, I'd go dig up, you know, once I started finding rocks, some of them you can just find on the surface, and then I realized if I dug in certain areas, not every area, but if I started digging a hole, I'd start pulling out rocks. And, you know, there'd be one hole, I could take out two or three wheelbarrows of anything from, you know, the size of your fist up to bigger than basketballs. You know, I was finding just big, massive rock, you know, kind of rock that four rocks in your wheelbarrow is too heavy to push kind of thing. They were really big. So I'm like, yeah, I got all this free material, but I'm wasting all my time going and getting it, but that's okay. 
I wasn't doing anything else really anyway so I had a lot of video of walking all over the desert finding rocks and pushing them back and so now I got piles of rocks in a few spots and then I decided I was going to build um, a water tank because I've seen a video on YouTube and so if you've seen a video on YouTube now you're an expert right but these guys in I think it might have been Cambodia or someplace like that they went in and with just a few bags of concrete they made a water tank that I'm thinking was probably at least a hundred gallons All right. so a little bit of rebar a little bit of chicken wire some concrete and then local sand and gravel and they made this water tank and they taught the locals how to do it and that was kind of the idea it's kind of like a mission they went out and showed them because it rains a lot there but the, the locals hadn't really figured out a practical way to store the water you know they'd catch it in pots and pans or something like that and then when the rain was gone they didn't have water again and so then they'd have to go find water so they said okay well here you know build this water tank out of concrete and then they showed them how to make eave troughs out of corrugated metal which I was like well that's pretty slick you know they take a piece of corrugated which is available to them and built a little u-channel and then some rebar for brackets attached that to the side of their thatched roof huts channel the water towards the tank it goes in the tank boom you're done put a little tap on the bottom so I'm looking at that I'm like okay I'm definitely gonna build something like that make a smaller one first for practice but I was seeing some videos uh, homestead economics on YouTube was one uh, I can never remember his name but oh if I think of it I'll link it but he was showing in a video his his whole house water system and what he's got is he's got um, rain gutters eave troughs whatever covering the whole or you know off every every part of the roof comes down down pipes comes across goes into the first tank is a sediment tank and then that flows into the other tanks and from what he was saying the amount of rain that he's catching and he's in a desert climate similar to here in the monsoon season he's catching enough water to last them through the year it sounded like they he didn't haul water anymore he had enough to catch to make it all the way through the year I'm like man that's the dream you know if I can get to the point I don't need to pay a water bill you know that's 40 bucks a month I could use for something else I'd buy crap on eBay I don't need uh, break so I started thinking okay my current design for the domes instead of building one big monster dome that's heavy and it's hard and it's too tall and it's a lot of work I thought if I can build a smaller dome make the first one where I could sleep and then learn the process kind of make any changes on that one and then build a second one and then a third one and then maybe a fourth one and so instead of making you know one big dome make a bunch of smaller ones and so I could have the first one will be my bedroom second one could be my office and computers third one could be a little mini workshop for tinkering you know and if I want to have a soldering station for soldering flashlights together into something else or making robots or whatever that could be in its own little dome okay so I marked off the spots for that and then I decided instead of making you know originally it was six domes in a circle and then I thought well I don't really need six so I'm like okay I could make a rock garden in one just for a kind of a cool place to get outside watch the sunset you know get outside kind of like then I thought okay I could build so make that kind of a feature feature and then I thought it'd be kind of cool to have a solar powered hot tub right and I've seen this done before and when I started finding all the rocks I'm like oh that's cool you know so the rock garden was where I'd put the really cool looking rocks when I found them I just set them there and make a little feature out of that you know, maybe a little rock wall around it and then the solar heated hot tub you know black pipe sun shines on it water comes out hot done you know a little electric pump to circulate it basically and that's it so I thought okay I do that make the tank itself out of concrete and nice big rocks that you can sit on and then you just have a after a hard day at work go take a soak in the hot tub you know 
and part of that would be the outdoor shower. So if I'm all dirty, shower, clean up, jump in the hot tub, soak for a while, dry off, come inside, you're done. Okay. Summer months, all of my showers have been outside. I haven't yet set up a shower inside, and it's November. If I shower during the day, if it's not too windy, and if now if I heat the water, it's only been in the last couple of weeks that I started heating the water. During the summer, the water is so warm, and if it's 100 degrees outside, you don't want a hot shower anyway. It's nice to kind of cool off in the shower, so I haven't needed to heat the water because the water ends up being 95 degrees anyway, just because it's 95 degrees outside. So that, that hasn't been an issue. Um, all my water is too warm, almost. Um, anyway, so it wouldn't be that hard to heat up water to 105 degrees for a hot tub just because it's already 100 degrees. So that's not a big deal. So I'm like, okay, take a shower, jump in the hot tub, boom. So you know, that was kind of a secondary feature over there. And I thought I could work a fire pit into the design if I decided to burn some scrub I could use that to heat up some water for the shower. All right. Problem is here, there isn't really enough wood to make it worth having a fire pit because there's mesquite and sage and, I mean, it'll burn, but it's so, it, it doesn't look like the kind of wood you would get much heat out of. It'll just flash and then it's gone. You know, it's not, it's not good campfire wood. Probably would smell nice. But. Anyway, so, I put some time into that, you know, digging the holes, finding the rocks, kind of assembling some of, you know, that, sketching out the design, and then I kind of just stopped. And I can't really pinpoint an exact time, but at some point I'm like, just, I just got burned out. And part of it also is when I realized, well, part, you know, a, a good part of it was probably about the same time when I had the motorcycle break down on the road. I had a, a chain break. Um, I was probably 20 miles from El Paso, so 80 miles from home still, something like that, somewhere in that area. I know where I broke down. I just can't remember how many miles, so at least 50 miles from home at least, or 60 miles from home, something like that. Yeah, I was 60 miles from home because I was next to a sign that said 63 miles, plus another 12 miles on this end. So 70 miles from home at least, irrelevant. Far from home, motorcycle breaks down on the way home. It's dark, it's after midnight. And I spent a couple hours on the phone with the roadside assistants and they could not find a tow truck to get me home. Yeah, not happening. So I spent the night in a truck stop. Uh, highway, highway patrol or sheriff, sheriff's deputy came and got me. Left the bike on the side of the highway. I spent probably an hour annoying a lot of truckers and regular people, customers, trying to get a ride out to uh, where I'm at here. Nobody, nobody wanted to give me a ride. I'm like, okay, I can understand that. Um, then I got mad and just started walking, you know. Not the smartest idea because it's summertime in the desert, but I walked for over 20 miles. Only one person stopped and they were going the wrong way because I was walking facing traffic the first half and then I started walking on the right side for hitchhiking, but, um, and I'm carrying too much stuff because I had you know, some water bottles I had filled up. I had my lunch bag with some food in it. Um, motorcycle riding gear. Left the helmet on the bike, but I had my jacket and my pants because they were expensive. I didn't want to replace them. So I'm carrying all this crap and I'm wearing my work boots. And I walked for over 20 miles in the heat. Like, ah. So that was the last time I rode the motorcycle to work. All right. Uh, time I fixed it, and then I started looking at, well, if I can sleep in the truck, I can do it for cheaper, then I can ride the motorcycle. And that was a funny thought when I realized it, but the motorcycle gets better gas mileage, but I had to come home every night because, you know, where am I going to sleep? 
if I took the truck, I could sleep in the back of the truck and only drive it once a week and then come home on the weekends and I realized that was half the price of driving the motorcycle. Go figure. So about that time when I realized I wasn't coming home every night, that's pretty much when I stopped picking up rocks and thinking about building domes. My energy then shifted towards could I make a could I buy or make a truck camper that was nice enough to sleep in that I could live in during the week. So then I spent uh, a couple weeks drawing up designs of a truck camper that I wanted to build because I figured out the price of, oh, crap, new clip. This is big. Oh, I didn't hear a beep because my headphones are plugged in. Okay. Ah, truck camper, part five or six already. So my thinking was, I wanted to build a truck camper because it would be exactly what I needed for me. Most campers that you buy are made to sleep four or to sleep six, and they've got every conceivable thing in there. They come with a little TV and a little radio and a furnace and an air conditioner and not just a cooktop, but an oven and a mini fridge and a shower and a toilet and holding tanks and lots of storage storage space because they've got little cabinets everywhere but they're all about this deep right so you you walk in you're like oh look at all the cabinets well right behind the cabinet is the vent for the fridge or for the oven or you know power distribution panels and so you, you think you get a lot of room but there really isn't well i used to have a motorhome and it was the same kind of thing. I realized that, yeah, it was made to sleep four or six, but I was by, by myself, and most of what they gave me was just taking up room, and I didn't need it. So I spent uh, some time gutting that, and then basically totally destroying the motorhome, and then decided I didn't want it anymore. So I like, okay, plus, um, and the other problem with the motorhomes and campers is they are built, I won't say built poorly, but they aren't built very strong. Uh, they're trying to keep the weight down, which you can understand, because if you got four people in the truck and all your camping gear and the, mo and the camper itself, and then water, you know, fresh water or gray water or black water, and then all your food and all your other crap, it's gonna weigh a lot. And it's really gonna screw it up because, you know, most people still have half done trucks and the truck's going to be driving like this, dragging its bumper, and your, your mileage is going to suck, and plus it's really tall, and so you get a crosswind, and it's blowing all over the place. So it's all a compromise. I looked at that, and I used to work on RVs. I, I lived and worked at an RV lot for probably six months or something like that, and I saw a few of the RVs that had come in after a wreck or something like that, and you realize how they're built on the inside, and you're like, uh you know, I live on the wrong end of 12 miles of really bad road. And I'm not even on the end of the road. There's another 20 miles that goes past me, I guess. But the road is really, really bad. Some days it's better than others, but it can be pretty rough. And I, I looked at how an RV was built or a motorhome or a camper. And I'm like, that is going to be such a pile of crap in about three months after driving back and forth on this road. It's just going to get destroyed. So my plan shifted from, okay, I'm going to hurry up and build domes to live in to I can't, I can't come home every night because I can't afford the time and the money of driving back and forth. Plus it's wear and tear on me and the truck or the motorcycle. And then the motorcycle broke down. And then I was like, okay, the truck gets about 15 miles to the gallon. And I can't afford to drive that back and forth every day because I'm putting on, I figured it out. I was putting a thousand miles a week driving back and forth to work. And it blew my mind when I did the math. I'm like, no way. It's a hundred miles each way. So that's 200 miles a day. Five days a week is a thousand. Four weeks is 4,000 miles a month. So I should have been doing an oil change every month, right? I'm like, what? That's not right. So, I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. It's it's just too far. Uh, I'm wearing everything out, 
you know, I came out here with a truck and a motorcycle that both ran good, and I started having problems on both of them, mostly because of the first 15 miles of road. So I'm like, okay, one, I need to sleep in my truck. It's the only way I can afford to even work anymore. You know, that, that became funny is it's costing me too much to get to work for the amount of money I make at work. It's not worth it. The whole idea of me moving from Austin to here was I didn't want to pay for my apartment and make land payments here. So, you know, people have asked, well, why don't I just get an apartment in town? Well, that doesn't solve the problem because I wanted to pay off the land faster. If I have an apartment that's 500 or $800 or whatever, that isn't going into land payments. Okay. So I'm like, nope. Um, one way or another, I'm going to make this work. Well, so that was when I decided not to go through with trying to hurry up and build the domes this year, put that money into building the truck camper. So my idea was to build a metal camper, weld together a metal frame, and then skin it with metal and make it really strong. Basically like... Um, more along the lines of like a race car construction. So metal, metal frame, metal, no, race cars would be probably fiberglass body, but so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go buy metal, weld it together, make a really solid thing, and then put in exactly what I need, you know, one bed, one little sink, one little propane cooktop, the, tr the cooler I showed earlier that was for that project, set up a spot for the laptop. Uh, and that was one of the things is if, if I'm in town, I've saved about four hours a day of driving because it takes me about two hours to get to work and two hours to get home again, right? It's not that far, but you have to slow down for the this end of the road, you know, so I can go, basically once I get to the freeway, it's 80 miles an hour until I get to work. But the first 15 miles, I got to slow right down, you know, 20 miles an hour. So, what can I do if I had four hours extra every day of not driving, plus the other hours I would be awake anyway? So, in the last couple of months or so, um, I wake up in the morning, I'm still in the work parking lot, I sleep there in the back of the truck, and then I leave work. Uh, I typically don't take a shower every day because where I work, it's not really dirty. Um, you maybe get a little bit sweaty, but you're not covered in grime and dirt. You're, it's relatively clean, so I, I take a shower every other day. So the days I take a shower, I wake up and I go straight to the gym, use their bathroom, because you know you wake up, you need to use the bathroom. So I just go there, use the bathroom, take a shower, put on clean clothes, leave. I don't use the gym for exercise. I just go there to take a shower. Um, it actually works out pretty well because it's uh, I got the cheapest membership I think it's 15 or 16 dollars a month and I get it you know a few showers and it's that's water I don't have to haul out to here for example you know, if I take a shower like for instance this week I took a shower on Saturday I work Saturday night today Sunday I'll take a shower here Monday evening or Tuesday morning before I go into work. So I'll work here for a day or two and then I'll take a shower and then I'll be clean when I go in. Uh, I work Tuesday night, Wednesday I don't really feel like I need a shower, so Thursday I'll take a shower, Friday I'm good, and then Saturday I'll take a shower. So I take two showers there, one shower here for seven days. If I was, if it's really hot in the summer, I, I sometimes take more showers, but lately I don't really feel like I need it. You know, I got my hair really short, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't look like I've slept for three days without taking a shower kind of thing. And you wash up a little bit and you're good to go. So that's that. Um, but yeah, then I was like, okay, so I'm going to build this truck camper. So I, I was like, okay, the generator I had was starting to look like it was going to give me trouble. So I bought the bigger generator. I needed a welder so I could weld the camper together. So I bought the welder. You need to cut the metal. So I bought the metal cutting chop saw and then another cutter. I bought some more grinders and grinder wheels, and then, of course, you need the helmet and the gloves, and there's a video about all of that stuff. 
and basically what happened is by the time I got everything I needed together basically how it turned out is by the time I got everything I needed as far as tools I had spent the money that I was going to use to build the camper oops parts you know it's like yeah you get all of a sudden you got money because I, I took out a loan against my retirement and I'm like okay I can take out this much money it's more than I need but then things kept popping up like I didn't plan on replacing the generator and then the generators looked like it was about to die and I'm like okay the winter's coming I need a new generator should I buy the same one or should I get a bigger one well the same one would run the welder because I tested it but if I decided I wanted to upscale um, for instance plasma cutter if you get a plasma cutter you also need an air compressor yeah. well if you use the plasma cutter and the air compressor at the same time the generator I had couldn't run them both at the same time I was pretty sure I actually didn't test it because I don't didn't buy it yet but I'm like okay if I'm gonna do it do it right so I also bought the solar kit and the batteries which is good because that's going to make the generator that I did buy last longer because I very seldom need it now. Um, day to day I can run off of solar and not touch the not touch the generator. You know, there's weekends I've come out here that I didn't start the generator once. This time I, I started the generator just to make the pot of coffee and then shut it off again. You're done. So that's that's been, a, you know, there's a lot of good investments and that might be a good side note, to a good takeaway. Yes, I don't pay rent. I'm paying a land payment. Um, my minimum land payment, arbitrarily, because of how much land I have, is three hundred and forty dollars. But that's mostly interest at this point. If I can make five or six hundred dollar land payment, it'll pay off faster, and that's what I'm working on right now. So I'm not paying seven hundred dollars. I think my apartment I figured was costing me about eight hundred dollars a month in Austin. And that was rent, water, not utilities, but then also trash. And then I had power bill was averaging about $100 a month in Austin. Okay. The first generator I got was only $200. Okay. I got six months out of it before it gave me trouble because I bought it before I came out here. And I used it when I took the bus seats out. So... $200 for six months versus $100 a month for power. However, I don't run, I don't have power constantly. Right now, at the moment, my inverter is turned off and the generator is off. So I don't have anything using power or, you, you know, I'm, you know, I don't have a fridge plugged in right now. Uh, I don't have my air conditioner. I don't have a heater. I don't have my computers running. I'm just running the camera. So at the moment, I'm not using any power. Solar panels are absorbing power and charging the battery bank, which I could look at, but I know it's charged. Um, so if I was in Austin, the fridge would be running constantly. Air conditioning was running a lot because it was really humid there. Um, and that's a, another side note to the side note, I guess. I don't need air conditioning in here to survive. Even if it's 100 degrees, it's relatively dry. It's kind of like you know people in Arizona talk about yeah, it's 110 degrees, but, you know, it's a dry heat. It doesn't really bother you. And it's true. I, I didn't really understand that until I lived in Austin. Austin would be 100 degrees and 100% humidity, and you just wanted to die. It really, it was awful there. I seriously believe that if there was a massive power outage that, you know, say if Austin, you know, World War Three happens and suddenly we can't generate power for whatever reason, you know, 90% of Austin would leave. You know, you wouldn't live there without air conditioning. You know, some people would stay, but I honestly don't think people would stay there if they if there was no air conditioning. I I know I was happy every time I left there. <laughs> you know, like ah, oh. when I came out here to camp, about halfway here, I opened the window and all of a sudden it was like ah, oh, you know, and so I could drive half of the drive here with the window cracked open a little bit and turn off the air conditioning and then going back you slowly feel like getting more and more uncomfortable I was like, ah, all right shut the window turn on the air conditioning 
you know, I just, I don't like to live like that. I like being outside. And in Austin, that was one of my biggest frustrations is I just didn't want to go outside anymore. You know, I was like, yeah, it's hot outside. I don't want to go out. You know, I've, I've spent time, I spent three years in the Mojave Desert in California. I was outside all the time then. You know, that's, that's when I really thought, yeah, you know, that's when I decided I, I was looking at where do I want to live or what do I want to do. And I remembered liking living in the desert um, where my dad lives up in Washington State. It's somewhat like this. It's sagebrush and deserty. You know, it's pretty hot and dry. He's the, everybody thinks of Seattle. That's the other side of the mountain. It's a completely different environment. This is a lot closer to where I lived for a while when I lived up there. So I'm like, yeah, I think I could, I could deal with this better. So, anyway, um, so the truck camper idea, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go do that. I bought all the tools. I'm basically ready to go. I changed the design a few times. I'm glad I didn't build it right away because my first one was going to be more of a big, real truck camper looking thing that was going to be wider than the truck and all the way over the cab and, you know, really pretty big. And then I started looking at it, and I decided this kind of has gone in stages, and I think they're they were necessary stages. Um, the conduit frame that was going to be for the truck tent, the tarp truck tarp tent, I think is what I called it. I did that for a week, and I actually had so much bad experience with setting up the tarp over the frame. That I didn't even actually use it in Aust or in in El Paso. I slept in it one night here after I built it just to see what it would be like, and it was awful, you know, because it's always windy here. I mean, not not every minute of every day, but there's a lot of days that are windy, and the tarp just rustled something terrible. So I'm like, no, that's not going to work. So I, I left the frame. I figured if I got rained on, I could pull the tarp over it. But if it was raining, I knew that was going to be a problem because usually it's windy and, and rainy at the same time. So there was actually two nights that I did get some rain, and I just pulled the tarp over the sleeping bag and pulled it over my head, and that was good enough. You know, I didn't pull it over the framework. So the weekend um, after that, I took that off and built the first version of what I did out of OSB. And, uh, but what I needed to do, I needed to see, could I live in the truck for a week without coming home? You know, just, can I do it at all? One, am I going to be able to sleep comfortably in the back of the truck without freaking out? You know, you know, what's it going to be like to sleep in a parking lot? Kind of like, you know, am I going to be comfortable with it? Is it going to really freak me out? Is, is it going to be a problem? Kind of thing. Then the next step is what do I do all day? You know, because I'm like, I'm going to wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning. I don't work until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's that's a long time. That's like 8 hours, right? Yeah. You know, so what do I do with 8 hours during the day? You know, I'm like, and I wasn't really sure at first. You know, I can spend some time in the truck, but then it's going to get hot. Then you got to run the truck all day because it's so hot. And um, To get the air conditioning. Now, it's funny because I just said I didn't need air conditioning, but if you're in a truck... You're in a greenhouse. And out here, I don't mind if I sweat a little bit, you know, if I'm working or whatever. It doesn't really bother me too much. But if I'm going to be sweating for eight hours in a truck and then go to work, you know, nobody wants to work next to you if you're like that. Anyway, so in the first week I was there, uh, living in the truck, is when I set up the gym membership for taking a shower. So that solved that problem. Um, started finding the libraries and figuring out when they were open. The library opens at 10 in the morning, except for Friday they open at 1. Um, so Friday is when I do laundry. So I get up in the morning, I eat breakfast somewhere, find a bathroom, go do laundry on Friday, doink around a little bit, maybe do some grocery shopping or whatever, go to the library at 1. And then I leave by 3 o'clock or so. It gives me time to make lunch and eat something and then go to work by 4. So that's actually worked out really well. And almost every day 
that I've gone to the library, I've been able to walk in, find a place to sit down that has a plug-in. And the libraries now are set up for people with laptops as much as anything. So, you, you know, you got tables with plug-ins and you can go in and sit down and, and nobody messes with you. They don't, you know, they're happy that you're there because I think they need to show that people are coming to the library to justify having one. If you had a library that nobody ever showed up at, they would lose funding and they'd close it down. So it's, you know, they're, you know, I always say thank you when I leave and they're like, no, thank you for coming in. So it's, it's not like I'm, nobody is annoyed that I'm sitting there for four hours with my laptop doing my thing. You know, it's, it's actually, that's worked out really well because I thought at first I was going to go find a Starbucks and sit there. Well, so many of the cool people are at Starbucks. It's hard to find a place to sit down that has a plug-in because there's so many people sitting there. And eventually they're going to want you to buy something. You know, you're sitting there for four hours and you haven't bought any coffee kind of thing. So, you know, the library for me, it works out a lot better. It's typically quieter. Most people that are there are pretty quiet. You just sit down and do your thing, read a book. You know, you, know, you see the old guys come in and, you know, during the day, you know, from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there isn't very many people in there. You know, most people are at work. I work in the afternoon, so that works out really well. So, take my shower, use the laptop, in the, and the, also the, the, la, the library has Wi-Fi, and there's no charge. You just go in and set up, and you're good to go. Uh, and then, you know, go to work. I, you know, buy groceries for the week. Typically, when I first get to work, you know, the first week I, you know, does this work out? I spend three nights here sleeping and I sleep four nights in the truck. So even though I work five days, so I go, I work Tuesday till Saturday. So I leave here Tuesday morning, uh, closer to noon, get to work, work that night. And then the last night after work, so Saturday night I work and then I drive home. So I sleep here. So, you know, I get to be here three nights and I work there four nights. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I typically, you know, I buy groceries for the week, like Wednesday. You know, so Tuesday I go to work, I just go straight to work. Um, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, I wake up, I go to Walmart the first day. And I kind of bounce it back and forth, you know. If I don't need a shower, I go to Walmart, use their bathroom, buy some stuff for the week make my breakfast in the in the parking lot a lot of times um i've got a little stove i think i'm on my third stove now they keep you know quit working or whatever um so i heat you know i'll make a pot of coffee here before i go to work and then i'll put it in thermoses and then i heat up the coffee and i make oatmeal in the parking lot i just break up my little stove put it on the tailgate make my breakfast Nobody really cares, you know, especially Walmart. They're like, oh, great. And, you know, everything in the truck is practically is what I've bought from Walmart. You know, so that if they, you know, if they ever looked at you, which they don't, you know, Walmart's got a really good culture about people parking in their car, in their parking lot. Um, you know, I'm making oatmeal. It's, it's Walmart brand oatmeal. You know, I'm drinking coffee. It's Walmart brand coffee. You know, the stove I bought from Walmart, that kind of thing. It's always... It's always not a big deal. <sighs> so that's kind of it for my six month first six months is the um, once I figured out that yes I can I can live in the truck during the week. That was kind of the first thing is can I do it? You know, so the truck tarp tent for the first week, you know, am I gonna be able to sleep in the truck? Is it gonna bother me? Am I gonna be so embarrassed that I'm sleeping in the truck I just don't want to do it? You know, am I able to get comfortable? Yeah, no problem. Um, the sleeping bag that I use, I'm sleeping on an army cot in the back of the truck right now. And the sleeping bag I made for the Alaska trip on the motorcycle. And I've tested that to below freezing already. Um, I woke up in a campsite where I was snowed in. You know, I spent two days in the campsite where I planned on leaving because there was so much snow on the road you couldn't ride the motorcycle out, you know. I woke up with the bag frozen 
because I was wet when I crawled in the sleeping bag, left all my clothes on, crawled in the bag, woke up, everything was frozen solid. I mean, it was stiff, you know. And I woke up, I was just fine. So, no big deal. Uh, I'm not worried about the cold. It's not that cold here anyway. It will freeze and it probably will snow. But it's never. It's not going to get like 40 below here, you know. Um, I made some improvements on the truck um, camper design now. Um, you know, initially there was a lot of air gaps, which in the beginning was good because you needed the airflow. Now it's getting cold, so I've closed up some of the gaps. Um, I'm considering giving myself some more vertical room inside the, the camper shell, which basically I'm just going to lift it up a little higher because it's not high enough right now. Um, but if I only sleep in there, it's not too bad. You know, I kind of crawl in, and once you're laying down, you don't care. So... I, I may do that this weekend, and I may talk myself out of it. I haven't decided yet. If I do it, I should get on it because it's one o'clock already. Um, okay, that's kind of it for the the last six months. Looking forward from now until back to summer again. Um, one way or another, I'm going to improve or rebuild the camper shell because I think that's a good enough design that it, it, the idea works. It just needs a little bit of improvement. Um. I may start building domes in the winter that I could then at least, you know, have started and probably live in before summer comes. Um, the school bus has worked well. It's not easy to keep warm in the winter and it's not easy to keep cool in the summer. So it's not ideal, but it has worked. You know, it's kept me dry, it's kept me high enough off the ground so I don't worry about getting wet. It's, you know, as as an idea for quick shelter, a school bus is hard to beat. You know, I could have tried to build a quick shack when I moved out here. I could have, you know, I thought about living in an army surplus tent, which would have been a nightmare because of how windy it is out here. Um, I thought about buying a little camper or a camper trailer. That might have been okay, but it would have been really small. You know, I wouldn't have bought something that was more than three or four thousand dollars. That's about how much money I had. You know, I bought the, the bus for four thousand dollars, forty-five hundred, something like that. So then I would have been, well, you buy a four thousand dollar camper trailer, it's probably tore up, the roof will leak, and nothing works. You know, this is typically the experience. Um, so then you're going to spend a lot of time fixing it, whereas in the bus it had a roof that didn't leak except for the vent that I broke it probably didn't leak before I broke it you know so that's been the one thing is I had to rebuild the vent and I really need to do it again I didn't do a very good job but essentially it's been a weatherproof shelter that's very very strong and that's the best thing I can say about a school bus is they're I won't say indestructible but the fact that they're made with safety in mind over everything else, they're made heavy. It's very solid. Um, I've had, you know, wind just pounding this thing and it rocks on the springs, but you don't feel like, oh, it's going to fall apart. You're not, you don't freak out. You know, if you've ever spent time in a tent trailer, for example, yeah, not a good, not a good feeling when it's windy outside. So, yeah, for the first year, I could totally recommend a school bus and then think about, you know, moving forward, building something more permanent. Uh, I'm still torn between do I want to build the shop first or the first dome as moving forward. Uh, everything that I have, my reason for coming here was so that I could build a shop. You know, because I've, I've always been stuck in living in the barracks or little apartments, and I really just want to have a place that I can build and tinker. You know, I just like the idea of making things, fixing things, inventing things, you know, creating things. You know, I can be about as happy with, you know, cardboard and hot glue as I can with a welder. You know, a welder is a lot cooler. But, you know, just the idea that I can make something. So, a workshop is in the is definitely in the list. Um, start building the domes, build the first one, get the idea figured out. I expect by May, 
you know, so at the end of my first year, I'll have at least one dome that I can live in and some kind of a shop that I can work in. Which becomes a priority. It, it keeps changing. I can, you know, it's like I can work outside. I've been doing it. I actually like working outside. I just don't want, at the end of my day, to have to spend, you know, half an hour picking everything up and pushing it back into the school bus. That's the biggest problem. You know, I'd love to be able to just leave all my tools on the workbench, close the door, done. You know, now, now I see the sun setting now that it's winter time. I'm frantically picking everything up, throwing it back in tow. It's pushing it into the bus because I don't have a proper tool system storage yet. So that's something I'd like to improve. Anyway, that's about the end of the clip. I've talked for hours already. I think I'll go get something done. See you, see you later. Bye.